My guest today, Senator Elizabeth Warren. And we're going to talk about power, the progressive movement, and how we reclaim our democracy. Okay. I'm ready when you're ready. Senator Elizabeth Warren, thank you so much for coming here and, and talking to me. Thank you. It's so good to be here with you. We'll, we'll just pick up one of these conversations that we've had we'll just, for years and years and just years. Just another string of That's conversations. That's right, another string of conversations. Uh, I, I'll tell you one, one thing I really wanted to get from you is a kind of insider view of how it feels, seriously, to be in Washington now and be in the Senate yeah. now with you know, Trump and the Republicans in charge of everything. I mean, how bad, when you get up in the morning, how do you feel? You know, it, it, it has two parts to it. Okay, let, and let me do both parts. One part, it, it's a little bit of a shaggy dog story, but, but an important one. 40 million people in America suffer from hearing loss, and fewer than one in six actually gets a hearing aid. And the principal reason is because of cost. The darn things cost thousands of dollars. They're not covered by Medicaid. They're not covered by Medicare. They're not covered by most private insurance. And most folks don't have the money for them. Um, it turns out that the hardware for those hearing aids is really not very expensive. I mean, like some scientists tell me it's within the range of 25, 30, 40 bucks, right? For the actual hardware. So why is the price so high? So this is gonna be a markets question, right? And could it have anything to do with monopoly? Oh, could, could I, it have I something a, to I, do? Do I yeah, get an bingo. A? Oh. That's right. You get yeah. an A on this. And the way that this handful of hearing aid manufacturers worked it out is state by state by state. They've got these complex rules in place that, frankly, protect them from any competition from mm -hmm. the outside. So I talked to a bunch of scientists about this, talked to some folks in the healthcare field, and basically the question became, why couldn't you sell hearing aids over the counter? The same way you can sell glasses over the counter. And yeah, there could always be a fancier version that costs more money. But what about the 1999 version, you know, the, the $100 version of a hearing aid or $200 version? A lot of people could get a lot of help at a price they could afford. And this is a nice thing about federal law, as you know. Federal law could come in and override state law and simply prohibit the states from saying nobody can do over-the-counter sales. FDA can put out some regulations, and we could open up a whole new market, 40 million Americans. So I had this idea, I talked to a bunch of scientists, I get it all written up, and I placed my first call to Chuck Grassley, Republican from Iowa. <laughs> and Chuck says, tell me about that again. That what? And I he says, walked what? through it. I what? can't hear you. He I says, can't hear you, I, I need a hearing aid. He walks through this, and he says, you know, that's a fine idea. Count me in. And next call goes to Johnny Isaacson, Republican from Georgia, Susan Collins, Republican from Maine, all under the political radar screen. And you put one person and another person and another person. So it's just you on the who phone get it? with just, them. That's right. Okay. Just it's this is just this, this is retail. Little, tiny, this is totally retail, retail. one offs. Yeah. And finally build a big enough coalition before the industry gets wind of it and by golly introduce this thing now the industry learns about it at one point the nra opposes it that's another whole crazy Wait, story I know, I know i know the nra doesn't want over the hearing counter aids. hearing aids. oh because of the loudness of Who knows? guns so we go through all this and at the end of the day there's a you know how this works there is a bill that has to move an fda reauthorization we take our bill, hook it on to that, like the little you know, car on the last, the caboose on the train. The thing goes through, it now, passes. Let me interrupt you for a second. Uh -huh. Is Grassley a co-sponsor? Oh yeah, he these, is so these the co-sponsor. So these are, these these are co-sponsors co okay. signed on the dotted line. And so this bill with Grassley gets hooked on, goes through, passes the Senate, passes the House. And a few months ago, Donald Trump signs it into law. And that means in within a year or so, we should start seeing over-the-counter sales of hearing aids. See, I thought this was going to be a, a terrible story. I was getting ready. I was I stealing myself. You're stealing yourself. For the hearing aid industry and the monopolists and but the big here's, money. But here's the point. Well, that's fabulous. You ask me about... 
can Washington work? And the answer is sometimes, yeah. Sometimes that's the place we're in and by golly, you make a difference. And you know, you wanna ask me, what keeps me, you know, how do you stay in the game? It's when you get to make well, changes. That was, like of course, that. That, of course. But when that you, keeps got, you in the game. But that, that raises a whole but. host of questions. <laughs> yes. I mean, Donald Trump signs this into law. Yeah. Why? I mean, this is the exception that proves the rule. Why did the hearing aid industry and all the related industries and all the monopolists that could be, you know, that have been making, it's not just hearing aids that are raking oh. off money, obviously. Oh, no, no, no. It's all of the sellers of the hearing aids. Yeah. Why were they caught off guard? Why did they let this through? Why didn't they, they get to the Republicans? Why did they get to Trump? They didn't hear about it fast enough. They the, thought they the were under no- The hearing aid people didn't hear about it. That's right. They thought they were under no threat. And we managed to get this thing in under the radar screen before anyone was able to politicize and, money and do all the things. And it's not a huge monopoly. It's a monopoly that's huge for that sector, but right. it's not a monopoly like Comcast, right. which keeps lobbyists on the ground every day, listening to every word. It's not that so when, that big. When you started off on hearing it, did you do a little map? Did you say, okay, I can get this done, even if I can't get done, this stuff, because they're big money and there's big yep. monopolists here, I can just sort of wiggle this through? Yep. That's exactly what it was about. And here's the point. You would ask me about how Washington works. Sometimes you can actually get No, that's get a it wonderful story. That's a wonderful story. That's a uplifting. I had no idea. And now you want to do the other stories? <laughs> you mean the bad stories. Well, look, at you know, we have a, a, a one of our videos coming out on Monopoly, and I yeah. want to send it to you. Good. Um, because you've done... a huge amount, and this is something the Democratic Party is picking up, but why aren't the Republicans? If you're concerned about the free market working, I mean, even Adam Smith was talking about, you know, producers getting together and monopolizing if you don't watch them. Yep. And we have more and more concentration of industry now than we've had in 40 years, at least, and the antitrust laws are not really working. Nobody's enforcing them. They didn't even enforce them under the Obama administration. And what's, why aren't the Republicans, why are they making themselves so vulnerable by not looking at antitrust? Corruption. I, I, I actually, that's how I see it. I think this is an issue of corruption. Here's how I see this. You start back in the 1930s, and of course you study this all the time, but coming out of the Great Depression, and you watch how Franklin Roosevelt, you know, we always think of Teddy Roosevelt as the trust buster, which he was, and helped get the laws through. But Franklin Roosevelt, as he's trying to put the economy back on a functioning basis, he calls in help and boy, they start enforcing the antitrust laws. And the whole idea behind that is by enforcing the antitrust laws, they create the openings for small businesses to grow, for innovators to come in. They create the opportunity for workers to have more power in their negotiations. This is after the NRA. So, first of all, he goes with the NRA and he monopolizes. But this but is the, after that. But he's here he is on antitrust laws, Department of Justice, starts bringing actions, mm -hmm. comes in and starts fighting. And that continues, let's be clear, through both Democratic and Republican Actually, administrations, the, the through Alcoa. Eisenhower, Alcoa. The Alcoa case. The Alcoa case, exactly. The great, I mean, you know, we know about the Alcoa That's case. That's right. Nobody watching this has any idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but the point is yeah. a giant monopoly case. And it really put the question to the United States government, are you strong enough to fight back against one of the most powerful corporations, not just in America, but in the whole world? And the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. A Justice Department that had, that was so determined that said, yes, we will come in and we will fight this fight. And that was important in my view, not just with Alcoa, but important for the signal it sent oh, everywhere. Huge. And huge. then came Robert Bork. Now he was my law professor. And I even worked for him in the Justice Department. You I did. hate to, I hate I to admit it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's an example of how a really big bad idea yeah. can be utilized politically by the Reagan administration. Yeah. But then why didn't, you know, the subsequent Clinton or Obama administration? So I think of it as big time periods 1935 to about 1980. There are differences between Democrats and Republicans, but the basic thrust is everything gets measured through the does it help America's middle class. 
right? Does it help create more opportunity? Does it help create stronger middle class? And think about it. Uh, GI Bill, uh, uh, the National Highway System, the, right. right? The investments in public education, the investments in research that help keep this economy robust and innovative, all that. It was all measured through this lens of America's middle class. Create opportunities for the poor by strengthening and expanding America's middle class. Set a minimum wage at a place where it could support a middle class life. Because of, because of the cataclysm of the Great Depression, the crash in the Great Depression creates this political demand That's right. to restore and enlarge the middle class. That's right. And a sense of we're not going to let giant corporations scoop up all the value, take advantage of their workers, take advantage of consumers. And it doesn't matter whether they're in rail, whether they're in steel, we're not gonna let them do this. So that's kind of the heart of how antitrust goes forward. And sure, there's some differences between Democrats and Republicans, but that's the direction. Ronald Reagan gets elected. And think about the, the two big parts of what he sells. The first one is, the polite word is deregulation. What it really means is fire the cops, not not the cops on Main Street, the cops yeah. on Wall Street. The antitrust regulators, the bank regulators, back them off, move them back. All the guardrails. All the guardrails, that's on exactly right. Yeah. All of those, so the big can get bigger and bigger and use that power to build up their profits. And then the second thing was, let's change progressive taxation. Let's cut taxes for those at the top. And once you cut taxes for those at the top, there's less money to make those investments in education, in infrastructure, in basic research. There's also more money at the top to influence politics. And now you get to the heart of it, and that's where I see much of this. When you ask the question about why, why don't the Republicans stand up against these monopolists? Why don't the Republicans push back against them? A big part of it is Money in politics now. And it's it's money in every way. Sure, it's money that's campaign contributions, but so much more. It's money to hire all those lobbyists. It's money. So you know, lobbyists, let me just do one off to the side. During after the financial crash and Congress is trying to rewrite the banking rules, the banks who had just taken $700 billion in bailout money, right? Congress had had to pass a law to make that money available to them. They were taking money from the Fed at, you know, out the back door in basically these free loans to, to keep them afloat. Those banks, instead of saying, thank you, American people, we are deeply grateful that you kept us in business <laughs> when we were insolvent. And thank you also for not sending any, any executives That's to right. jail. That's right. Thank and you for thank your you forbearance. And thank you for letting us go home at night and sleep in our expensive homes while other people go to jail, but we don't go to jail when we break the law. Instead of saying that, they got together and said, whoa, someone's gonna be write, rewriting the laws to keep that crash, that kind of crash from happening again. I know what let's do. Let's spend more than a million dollars a day lobbying against financial reforms. Oh, and let's put right at the center of that, let's lobby against that little Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that oh, I remember we have that. for an idea. You remember that? I remember you that You remember one. that? I had Elizabeth that Warren's name on it. That little CFPB. Let's make that the center of what we definitely are going to kill off before that idea takes hold and becomes law. That's So my point is, it's campaign money. It's lobbying money, it's think tank money, it's taking Bob Bork's paper and spreading it all around. Oh, it's, 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 it's every a deluge. part. It's it a is. deluge of it money. Is. But are Democrats, now this is a delicate question, and I am a Democrat, and mm -hmm. I was in a Democrat I'm a Democrat. And I was, in, I was a cabinet officer. But listen, if we're talking about monopolization and the diminution of antitrust and money in politics, Democrats have been not as bad as Republicans, arguably, but hey. And look, that's why we've got to have real change in Washington. The way I see this, Bob, is that we got to get out there and be real clear about what we're running on. We are running to try to make this government work again, not for the richest 
Americans, not for the ones who have enormous power and can spend a million dollars a day lobbying, but make it work for working families, but make it work for the poor. But, here's, but here's the deal, Bob, we not only gotta say it, we not only gotta talk the talk, we gotta be willing to walk the walk if we are blessed to get power again. Well, it's all about power. I mean, can you get power? I mean, I think you can. You can get power without uh, sucking up to the moneyed interests, uh, but the moneyed interests are so overwhelming. And yep. is the Democratic Party, as a party, as capable a party. of biting the hand that feeds them? I mean, it's not as big a hand that feeds the Republicans, but it's still a hand that feeds them. And are we going to field and be able to field candidates in 2018? And also, I don't want to get make you in a, okay. put you in an awkward position. Let's stop right there. But are we going to be able to field candidates that really do have that sense that power has got to be shifted in this country? Okay, so let me do it both ways. The first is, this is a question that keeps me up at night. I am deeply, deeply worried about this. I'm worried about it. Because, boy, if we don't get out there and do it, I guarantee nobody else is. And, and this country have, fundamentally changes. And we're going to have Trumps as far as the eye yep. can see. As, uh, it's not all just the way. Donald Trump. Not, that's right. It's demagogues. And then, and then, and then. But let me tell you the part that makes me optimistic. Here's what makes me optimistic. I, I went to the inauguration. I wanted to see it. Uh, up close. I, I, no. It's now burned into the backs of my eyeballs. Yes. No, no, no. And... I wanted to see this, and I believe when the history of this time is written, they'll talk about that dark speech. They'll talk about the first fight that man chose to make the, the, the emblematic of his presidency was how big were the crowds that came to adore me, right? But when you write the history of this period, it will also be about the next day. The day when women in their pink pussy hats and friends of women and little kids and seniors, people came out. We had the biggest protest march in the history of the world. And, and from there, look where it went. People said, eh, yeah, but you know, the sophisticates, will they still be here in a week? And the answer was, oh yeah. Will they still be here in a month? And the answer was yes. And will they still be here in a year? More than ever. Will they vote? Will they vote? Well, I'll tell you the this. Largest, the largest party in America is not the Democrats or Republicans. It's the party of non-voters. That's right. Especially in midterms. Yep. And the real question is turnout. And are people who are fed up with not just Trump, but also big money and the moneyed interests, are they going to actually get out and vote? So I think that voting is an act of optimism. Mm -hmm. You do it if you believe that your vote, combined with a lot of others, will actually make a difference. So to the extent that Democrats in these races in 18 stand up and say, here's what I stand for, here's what I will be held accountable for, I'm going to make it clear what I'm willing to do I think we pull people in who are ready to vote. Well, I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, you know, in 2015, I was out in red states. This is the start of 2015. Yeah. And I was talking to people who were angry. They weren't getting ahead. They were just working harder than ever. Yeah. The game is rigged. And I said, well, who are you thinking about voting for? And I kept on getting back the same two names from the same people. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking about either Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And I said, how can you put those two names in the same sentence? Right. That's, but they said, we want somebody who's going to stand up to the money and stand yeah. up to the power yeah. and stand up to the rigged game. Uh, and the question we are now talking about is whether in 2018 and in future years, Democrats are willing to do that. Yeah. And you think they are? Well, I mean, put, look. It's, we're talking about, I mean, it's, it's a huge power shift. It is. It is the power shift. This is everything that's broken. You can tie back right into this. It's the seizure of government, our government, by the rich and the powerful, and that they are making it work for them. And what we've got going on our side is a whole lot more of us than there is of them. And if we will actually use the power of the vote, 
We have the capacity to take this historic moment and to turn this democracy into something that truly represents the people. Well, we have to. I mean, we have to, we don't have a, a chance. But you know, in 2000, Al Gore, when he was running, uh, the only time in the last, it was only the last month where his polls started to really soar was when he said, we've got to take on the privileged and the powerful. Yep. And that phrase, and he was kind of surprised, you know, mm -hmm. how did that, what's mm -hmm. going on? It was the first inkling that I had, well, I sort of had inklings during the Clinton administration, but the first inkling I had that taking on the privileged and the powerful, that there was a sense in this country that things had got off track in some very, very fundamental way. Yeah. But he didn't follow through. The Democrats haven't followed through. Obama, I love Obama. I mean, I thought he was, even if Trump was not such a horrible person, Obama would still in my books be a hero. But he, you know, I wish he had been more aggressive about a lot of these things. So, you know, for me, it was the work I, st I studied families who went broke. And I did that in, in big part because that was my family. I, I'd grown up in a family that was a paycheck to paycheck family. My three brothers, big brothers, all go off and join the military. And when my daddy had a heart attack, it just turned our family upside down. And it felt like to a kid in no time at all, we lose the family station wagon, and every night when I go to bed, I hear my mother cry. We're gonna lose our house, we're gonna lose our house. And I watched my family struggle. I watched my mother, she was 50 years old, she never worked outside the home. I remember the morning that she, she's in her bedroom, their bedroom, and she's crying and talking to herself, she says, we're not gonna lose this house, we're not gonna lose this house. And, she dries her eyes and blows her nose, and puts on her lipstick, and pulls on this dress, and her high heels, and she walks to the Sears and she gets a minimum wage job. A minimum wage job in an America where a minimum wage job would support a middle class family. Not easy, but three of us, and she could still make a mortgage and put groceries on the table and keep us stitched together till daddy finally made it back to work. And that happened. I always heard that story in my, you know, this is so woven into me. It's about tough women who do what need to be done, but it's also about a government on your side. A government that said, I'm gonna set a minimum wage. We're collectively, Congress is gonna set a minimum wage where it works for a working family. Today, I, I've been through these hearings. Congress won't set a minimum wage for a working family. It's for the restaurant industry comes in and says, well. It's the other we, NRA. That's right. We, I mean, we don't want to see any changes. We're happy with things where they are. But I think you put your finger right on the heart of it. It's who this country really is going to work for. Is it really only going to work for a handful of employers, a handful of big businesses, a handful of big banks, a handful of you know, Comcast and cable providers, the giants who just keep sucking up more value? Or are we gonna be able to take this democracy and turn out enough people, enough people who, who come off the sidelines, enough people who say, you know, I used to vote, but that's all I ever did. Enough people who say, but now I'm in this. I have a group. I'm, I'm making, I'm knocking on doors. I'm making phone calls. I'm, I'm posting on Facebook. I'm tweeting. I'm, I am in this fight. If we have enough people who do that, we get to take this country back. But the we, in your sentence, has got to be presumably um, a Democratic Party or a set of leaders who have big ideas yeah. and big ambitions and get people excited and also have the credibility yeah. to put those ideas into practice. Yeah. And it's not just raising the minimum wage. It's oh, not yeah. just antitrust. It's also dealing with stagnant wages for the last 35 years, yeah. dealing with this huge onslaught of money in politics, mm -hmm. dealing with you know uh, things that people care about. Yeah. 
at the rate, at the kind of scale yeah. that it has to be. I mean, I, I again, I personally have a great deal of affection for Hillary Clinton, but her policies were, were I mean, there were so many of them. They were well thought out. I thought they were terrific, but nobody heard them because they were so small. So my sense of where we go next is that voters are actually pretty smart and that they get things. It's not always the way I want it to come out. I don't always like, like parts of it. But I think the, the question that people are gonna ask going forward is, do you care about people like me? And are you actually willing to get up and fight for me? Because if we can answer that yes, and yes, we care and we will fight, and then truly deliver, we can change this country. Couldn't agree more. Good. I couldn't agree more, and I'm gonna let you go because you have to go change the country. <laughs> uh, but let me just end with one of my favorite quotes from Louis Brandeis, oh. the great justice, who said, we have a choice. We can either have great wealth in the hands of a few, yes. or we can have a democracy but we can't have both. Yes. And that's really what you're saying is at stake. And indeed, there could be nothing, I don't think, larger at stake. I think, I think that's right. Louis knew what he was talking about. He did. He was coming off the last Gilded Age. Yeah. He didn't anticipate this Gilded Age. But here it is. But we're back. Yeah. So. It's so good to see you. Thanks so much for coming. I'm so glad to be here. I really here. appreciate good. it.